We are back with another episode of Dynasty Decisions. This is where we take your questions, tackle your rookie draft conundrums, talk about rebuilding, contending, all the trades that you guys have made. Should be a fun one. We got seven teams queued up. We're going to be running a double header this week. This one will be coming out you know, Wednesday or something. We'll have one later on in the week with some more teams to cover. So should be a fun one. Stick around to the end. Now let's get into it. All right, so we are into the first team of the video. This one comes from a Mother Flocker tier subscriber over on Flock Fantasy. And of course, if you guys want to skip the line, that is how you can do it. We are going to get to some free teams in, I believe, in this video, but definitely in the next video. 12-team, uh, full PPR, lineup league, six-point per passing touchdown for Ash here. Super flex league, Justin Herbert, Kyler Murray is the top quarterback. Zach Charbonnet, nothing much else there at running back. Wide receivers, Drake London, T. Higgins, Josh Downs, Marvin Mims, and Trash, apparently. Greg Dolchich is the main tight end, but he does have a lot of draft capital, 101, 105, 110, 201, 202, 207, 208, 210, et cetera there. And then uh, all of his extra picks in 25, including an extra second rounder. So he does say he has a plan so far for the draft. His plan is to take Marvin Harrison Jr. at 101, even though it is a super flex league. He does say, I hope Neighbors falls back to me at 105, or should I just take Odunze at 105 if Neighbors doesn't make it? Um, and then he said, thinking A.D. Mitchell slash, you know, Lad McConkey, somebody like that at 110. And then he said he needs running back help badly. Uh, not sure if he should focus on drafting them. I would say your second round picks are fine if you yeah. want to take shots. Um, on drafting a running back at that point, he said, I I'm likely not competing till 2025. Yeah, no. And uh, real quick, looking at this team, you have obviously your quarterback set, despite having all those future picks that you have with the 101, the 105, the 110, et cetera, there, you have all of your picks after that in 2025 and 2026. So you position this team. Well, being set at quarterback, having a couple names at wide receiver while still having the assets to be able to get a couple more added to this team. Uh, Greg Dolchich, despite not being set at the tight end core. Has some upside, and again, because you don't need the production from the position, you may as well take an upside shot on a guy like that. The profile that Greg Dolchich has, obviously, as a rookie going into this year with Sean Payton. So overall, I like how you structured this team. Uh, you mentioned here uh, MHGI 101. I'm cool with it only if you do your due diligence, and I'm sure Corey was going to uh, mention that as well. Try to see if the 101 can end up getting you a wide receiver we have ranked higher than Marvin Harrison. Try to see if 101 can move down to 102, maybe pick up a future second if that guy needs quarterback after you. Do all that, and then if you know, you're know you unable to make a deal, nobody wants to really go up and get that 101, I'm fine with taking Marvin Harrison at that instance. Yeah, for sure. And I think um, he he basically asked, should I just hammer wide receivers with that the 201, 202, 207, 208, 210, those types of picks? Because we do have a great class on our hands at wide receiver. Next sure. year's class is better for running backs. You're trying not to get a bunch of running back production on your team to begin with because you're not going to be competing this year. I'm sure you want to tank your own first round pick as well. So I would say generally speaking, that's a good strategy. Although I will say at 202, if you can make one deviation for a running back at 208 or whatever, maybe you make a deviation for a tight end or something like that uh, with JT Sanders or Ben Sennett or something like that. Um, you have the ability to probably hammer wide receivers for the most part, but maybe making a deviation here and there is not the worst idea. The other thing too is, with your 201 and 202, if we get lucky that, you know, Bo Nix or Michael Penix go in round one, it's possible that you could grab your QB3 there because it looks like you're going to be passing on quarterback at 1-1 and 1-5, assuming Marvin and Malik are there for you. But I will say at 105, if Malik is gone and he says, should I just take Odunze there? I personally would take the falling value of Drake May or Jaden Daniels, whatever one ends up being on the clock for you. Yeah, I would agree. As much as I love Roma Dunze, I think he's the clear 106 in this class. Uh, just because the hype that we're going to see for Jaden Daniels, the draft capital there, obviously is going to propel him up on the market value. And then, of course, us personally, especially when it comes to Drake May from a talent profile perspective, he's got the makings to be up there with the Allen, the Herbert, where Trevor Lawrence was valued last year. I really do feel like the physical makeup of Drake May. Yes, he's young. Yes, he's raw, but he's going to get draft cap where he's going to be put in the right position to be able to develop. And a lot of the issues that he has right now is very coachable young quarterback mistakes. So I would value Drake May there. Uh, even if your league lets him fall to the 105. I mean, at that point, I'd rather just take the falling value of Drake May, maybe seeing if Kyler Murray can be able to net you Puka Nakua plus a little piece or Garrett Wilson plus a little piece. But even if that little piece is a second, as much as I like Kyler Murray, I think Drake may at the 105 is more of a steal at valuation than Kyler Murray, even if he's valued at market value. 
Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you have a lot of flexibility if you do take a quarterback like that, moving off of one of your existing quarterbacks or maybe just holding him until he gains value and selling him once people kind of feel like he's the real deal. Because if Drake May does turn into the next CJ Stroud in terms of his value and he climbs all the way up to a top five dynasty quarterback, then you're going to be feeling good that you got him all the way down at 105. Like I'm sure a lot of people who got CJ Stroud 104, 105, 106 last year in the rookie draft probably felt. So um, he does have some trades listed here. It looks like he moved off of the 101 last year. Um, which was Bijan, obviously, including Russell Wilson and Cortland Sutton. He was able to get Justin Herbert out of that, which is definitely transitioning off of a running back asset into an elite quarterback. Herbert's valued more than Bijan now. And and think of the the safety of this asset. I mean, Herbert's lost his top two receivers, and he's still valued higher than Bijan Robinson. And Bijan had a pretty good rookie season. Things are looking up for his situation, and he's still behind Justin Herbert. So that just proves how good it is to invest in elite dynasty quarterbacks, especially when your team is not ready to compete, which yours obviously was not this time last year. Uh, the other trade that he ends up making, Derek Carr, Brandon Ayuk, and a first that became 108 at the time. He probably assumed it was a little bit later than that. Um, Kyler Murray is what you acquired in that deal. So again, Ayuk obviously had a great season this year, so that hurts a little bit. The 108, probably a little bit higher of a pick than you were expecting. But again, you bought in on an elite quarterback. Yeah, no, I'm never going to fault buying in an elite quarterback. If you're compounding these two deals, you receive Justin Herbert, Kyler Murray, the nucleus of your team in exchange for the 101, the 108, Russell Wilson, Cortland Sutton, Brandon Ayuk, and Derek Carr. Like in a start nine league, the needle movers matter a ton. So, I mean, I guess you can make the argument there that Bijan will also gain value in a start nine type of league. But at the same time, having such an elite quarterback duo in a start nine with their point production and a six point passing touchdown is going to be in the, you know, 23, 25 plus point per game range. I'm very cool making this move. And then the final one here, Tank Dell in exchange for T Higgins. Obviously, Tank Dell, uh, in terms of value, has really grown since you made this trade. I'm assuming the rationale was probably a couple games of Tank Dell. He was playing really well you're like oh shit he might tank my own pick uh, or he might ruin my tank of my own pick to maybe the 102 the 103 the 104 range so at the time you buy hello on t higgins now obviously tank dell's value has risen t higgins a little bit has fallen but even despite that they're still relatively close in market value i would say so i like the process yeah, the tough part is that like Tank Dell did fit your build a little bit better because sure. he was a younger player and buying in on an older player is maybe not the worst thing in the world. But like you said, your rationale at the time was probably this guy might fall off and be a top 36 dynasty wide receiver by the time the season is done, not continue doing what he's doing and be valued basically similarly to where T. Higgins is valued at this point in time. So again, a little bit unfortunate there, but generally speaking, I think the process was sound for all of these deals. I think you're making moves that you need to be making. Um, in this year's rookie draft, again, if you want to hammer out the wide receiver position, really build out that core, maybe add another tight end to the group, even a QB three, if one falls to you in the early second round there, yeah, that's probably the strategy I would be looking to do. And then if you can, I mean, try and punt some picks into 2025 as well. If somebody on the clock at 208 wants to send you their 2025 second, feel free to just take that for the 208. And then, uh, like you said here, like the 2025 running back class is going to be better. That's the position you're going to be looking to attack probably in 2025 because your team after you add all these wide receivers and other positions will probably be just running backs away from being in a house money or even a competitive window of things break right for you. So a um, lot of good moves so far. I think we could probably move on to the next team here, which is from uh, Wenzel here, 12 team PPR, six point per passing touchdown, full tight end premium. So tight end position, knowing that you have Sam Laporta is definitely very, very valuable. Super flex league with uh, Patrick Mahomes, Jared Goff, Will Levis and company there. Christian McCaffrey, David Montgomery, Austin Eckler and company Talk there. Um, decent depth there behind those guys. Stefan Diggs, Tyler Lockett, Terry McLaurin, Amari Cooper, Chris Godwin and others. Jonathan Mingo, guys like that at wide receiver. Does not have any of his picks, though, in 24 or in 25. I will say, though, if you are not going to have your picks for 2024 and 2025, this is the type of team you would need to basically make that worth it. Because realistically, on paper, like I would be shocked if you're not at least a top two team on your league. Like you have the advantage at the quarterback position there with Patrick Mahomes, Jared Goff, Will Levis. Patrick Mahomes giving you that top end production. Jared Goff giving you, despite not having the liquidity of a top end quarterback in Dynasty, probably a safe, you know, top 12 to 14 at minimum projection in terms of a point per game basis. And then Will Levis gives you a little bit of more upside where Jared Goff's your safe quarterback too. Will Levis could eventually be your quarterback too, especially with the top 12 ceiling he has from an asset standpoint. So in terms of a quarterback, core, I love like, that build for I, a competitive I really do. team. Man. If really you're not going to have two elite quarterbacks, which is obviously the ideal situation to be in, I actually like this 
um, you know, when you're spreading out your assets yeah. and you need to go a little bit weaker at the quarterback position, having a build like this, where you have one elite quarterback, one undervalued, good productive quarterback like Jared Goff, and then an upside swing like Will Levis behind him. Yeah, for sure. It's a well-structured team. Start 11 league. You go uh, r- roughly five deep at wide receiver in terms of, you know, set it and forget it type of guys, I would say, with a couple guys where, you know, Brandon Cooks on the Cowboys could have some spike week potential, uh, especially if you're going through some buys. We don't know what Jonathan Bingo will look like, but, you know, maybe maybe he's relevant there. And then in terms of running back, like you have Austin Eckler, who, despite not being what he was from a, a value standpoint last year, should still have relative, you know, decent RB3 type of utility into your lineup. So really good uh, overall team for a contender. He does say that there's a 0.75 tight end premium. Having Sam Laporta obviously is very helpful in that regard. He said that most of the guys in the league are all fairly sharp. They listen to the Dynasty Trades and Five guys, so uh, they definitely know what they are doing. Everyone in this league is low on running backs. They value wide receivers to the most, even with the slight premium for tight end. So relative, like this sounds like a type of league that me and you would be in pretty much. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be like the first thing that sticks out with your roster is I would ideally like to have one more really good wide receiver, right? If I'm competitive, if I'm competitive, even if it's a Devontae Adams, a Debo Samuel, somebody that might be a little bit more undervalued because they're not young. If they're listening to content, they're probably going to value those young wide receivers like gold, right? They're not going to move those guys. What I would maybe consider doing if you have the assets to do it, maybe you have to make a package deal. Maybe you can move, say, Terry McLaurin plus Jonathan Mingo in a small piece, and you can go up and get Debo Samuel or Devontae Adams from a competitive team that needs more depth. I think that wouldn't be the worst deal in the world. But again, if people are going to hold on to wide receivers like their gold, that might be semi, uh, semi-challenging as well. I mean, the other road I, I do see, again, they don't value the tight end, so it really just depends the context of the offer. But uh, I still believe in Michael Mayer potentially bouncing back. You do have Sam Laporte as your main tight end one. Dallas Goddard has some p- appeal. Maybe see if the Jalen Hurts owner wants to create that stack. Dallas Goddard, obviously, the context of the situation in Philly, he's a really talented player. But, I mean, they're a low-passing volume offense. They have Devontae Smith. They have A.J. Brown. So I don't really feel like the real-life you know, situation of just how good Dallas Goddard is will reflect that in terms of fantasy. So if you can potentially package him at top 10 to 12 type of dynasty tight end prices and get another wide receiver added to this team, that's another avenue I'd explore. Yeah, that's a good point. Mayor, especially because he could gain a lot of value if he just starts to produce maybe early on next season, you see him producing early on in the year. Maybe you sell off on him for, like I said, a D- Debo Samuel, Devonte Adams, somebody yeah. like that um, to try and help compete, uh, compete with your wide receiver core there. So um, he does say he has to run it back next year. Obviously he doesn't have his picks yeah. or anything in 24 or in 2025 and then figure out what's next. I mean, the nice thing is your team should still be very competitive next year and even potentially in 2026 as well, depending on how Christian McCaffrey and Stefan Diggs and stuff uh, age their games. But he's like, what moves should I make to keep the window open or should I retool? I think this is an interesting conversation because we actually don't get a lot of teams submitted to dynasty decisions that are in this situation where yeah. could you be proactive and retool and try and get a little bit younger or should you just keep your elite production? Christian McCaffrey, Stefan Diggs will be high-end redraft picks because me and you made a trade in tone setter truthers where I yeah. made a move to make myself uh, have a bigger window, but lose a little bit of point production when I traded yeah. you Christian McCaffrey and Devonte Adams for Travis Etienne in the one Oh seven. So that was the ki- type of situation that maybe if a deal like that comes on the table for him, where he can sell off Christian McCaffrey for a young, but still very productive running back and get some draft capital out of it. Maybe you explore that. But to me, I think knowing that you don't have your picks next year, and I obviously do have my own picks next year. That's the difference in our team structure. Uh, it makes sense to just run this thing back. Yeah, no, I would agree for sure. And again, maybe it comes to the point where you're entering the championship this upcoming season and maybe maybe you lost in the semifinal. Like, like let's just talk about the situation that happened with us, right? You lost in the semifinal. I made the championship. I was projected to be the underdog going into the week. So I said, you know what? The upgrade that I'm making uh, from obviously the 107 who, you know, from a value standpoint is valued higher than Devonte Adams, but can't give me the point production for that championship week. And hypothetically the, the upgrade I'd be getting from ETN to McCaffrey from a point production standpoint would have been worth it. Now didn't end up materializing like that. Cause ETN actually outproduced McCaffrey in the championship week. Cause I think McCaffrey's like, uh, I want to say his calf pulled lame in that game, but did end up securing the championship. So despite, you know, the actuality of the trade, not being consequential, it's still worth it in my eyes. Uh, if it comes to that situation where you, you're in Bush's spot, you lose in the semi and somebody wants to go buy a Christian McCaffrey to make that, you know, extra push. And maybe they have 
Maybe they're willing to give you Jameer Gibbs for Christian McCaffrey at that point. Maybe they're willing to give you, you know, Brees Hall. Maybe because it's a content league, it's maybe less just JT, that happens, ETN, but, Kyron is the best you can yeah. get at that point. Plus, yeah, no, I'd agree. Yeah, for Something sure. Like so that, overall, though. I think your team's in a good spot. He does have some trades listed here. He did. I did sell off Mark Andrews in the two twelve for Sam Laporta. I don't know how you did that, to be honest. I guess it was Deal. November, so people weren't quite as bought into Sam Laporta yet. But that has aged very, very well, especially knowing that this is a heavy, heavy tight end premium league. Laporta is he's got to be a top two round asset, at least in this format, potentially even uh, early second rounder um, in this format. So, yeah, definitely love that move for you um, on you know, uh, the 27th of December, you sold off a third and the 211 for Amari Cooper. I'm assuming you did this to try and make a championship push. Um, so that was a pretty good move, I think. And then 304 and a 2026 20, second, your own, you sold off for Chris Godwin, which again, I think given your wide receiver core and you needed some depth, some cheap point production, I think Chris Godwin makes some sense. Yeah, for sure. Overall, I mean, you know what you're doing. You're trying to go win the championship. You put yourself in a position to be able to go do so. And at this point, man, it's just about making that ROI. Yeah, exactly. So explore some moves during the season if you can. Again, uh, the tight end core is the area of your team that you're very strong at, especially considering the premium format. So if you can move off of Dallas Goddard, who gets out to a hot start, Kate Otten, who gets out to a hot start, Michael Mayer gets out to a hot start, somebody like that, you might be able to cash in for another wide receiver piece. But again, like you said, these guys value wide receivers very heavily, so that might not be possible either. So uh, let's move on to the next team here, which is from uh, Ethan. He has uh, listed here a 12-team PPR, one quarterback league. So uh, Brock Purdy is the only guy that you need, but also you're a little light at that position. Yeah. Roshan Johnson, Kendra Miller, a bunch of zero RB guys there. Tank Dell, Jane Reed, Jahan Dotson, Marvin Mims, uh, Greg Dolchich, Johnny Smith, Mike Gusecki, and guys like that. Um, do have a lot of draft capital, though, thankfully. 101, 103, 105, 109, 201, 206, 207, 306, 307, and then a couple extra mid-round picks in 25 and 26. So pretty barren roster, but a loaded cupboard full of draft capital. He talks about, you know, his plans right now is to take Marvin Harrison, obviously, at 101 in a one-quarterback league. Neighbors slash Odunze at 103. Again, no arguments there. Burrow slash, uh, sorry, not Burrow, Bowers slash Caleb with the uh, 105 potentially. And then he said, thinking to take a couple running backs with, uh, two, um, you know, some of the picks like 201, 206, 207, those type of picks to me, I, I think it's, a. I would not take Caleb at 105. I would take I Bowers at 105 and hope Absolutely, that a yeah. quarterback falls to you at one nine and maybe even Caleb falls to you at one Oh nine. Yeah, I would agree with that. Uh, as much as I like Caleb Williams, like I do think because you have the 109 asset, I wouldn't push him up the board to the 105. Uh, I would say 105. Yes, it's a little bit of a tear break, uh, I would say, from the top four assets. I don't know how likely it is. Maybe see, you know, explore your options. Can 105 get me up to 104? Can 105 get me up to 102? But most likely those owners know the tier they're dealing with and probably won't give you that pick. In the context of the 105, like you still have Tank Dell, you still have Jaden Reed, and you're probably going to add two wide receivers. Uh, you could start up to four per week, though. So I wouldn't be opposed to just getting another wide receiver for taking Thomas Worthy, McConkie, yeah. whoever gets the best landing spot. And like, think about it this way. If you wanted to take Caleb Williams at 105 because he is your 105 and um, we have him ranked, I would say, fairly aggressively relative to some people's opinions on one quarterback yeah. leagues because Caleb Williams does run. He is a dual threat quarterback who has a chance to become one of the next NFL greats. And even though you know, he doesn't have the value in a one quarterback league that he does have in a super flex league. He's still going to be a top three round startup asset, in my opinion, at least given his profile um, and given what he could do at the next level. Yeah. To me, though, there's not a huge difference at 105 Caleb Williams versus if Drake May falls to 201. Like I would just much rather take Drake May at that price discount, especially knowing you have Purdy, who's a decent enough quarterback already. Um, or Jaden Daniels potentially at 201 if they end up sliding there. So for me, if, if Caleb is that much more expensive in a one quarterback star, um, a rookie draft than the other top two quarterbacks or top three quarterbacks, I would probably just opt to take those other guys at 201 or 206 potentially even. Yeah, no, I would agree with that analysis. Uh, I mean, overall, he does say, uh, like you mentioned, planning to take those guys. He's thinking he needs to take a couple running backs with his, with his second rounder. So he's got the 201, the 206, the 207. Um, given the context of your team, start eight league, like assuming you take three quarterbacks, or sorry, three wide receivers and maybe a quarterback in the first round with those four picks. Hypothetically, let's just say you added Marvin Harrison Jr., Roma Dunze and um, I don't know, Brian Thomas Jr. with the 105 for your wide receiver picks. And say at the 109, you add either Caleb Williams, Jaden Daniels, Drake May at that spot, hypothetically, right? 201, 
let's just say the best player available could potentially be Jonathan Brooks, could potentially be Trey Benson. I would say I wouldn't go overly heavy at the running back position because uh, like if I'm taking, you know, Blake Corum over Xavier Leggett, I just feel like that's flawed process. Realistically, uh, yes, it's a start eight league, but I'm cool just taking whatever value is at the picks. If you want to break a tie with running back over receiver, I'm fine with that. But it's not like you have like a solidified wide receiver core where I'm opposed to doing that. Yeah, not to mention too, like in 25, you have a number of good picks as well where you're going to be able to yeah. fill out your running back core in a much deeper class. Again, we have to take what college football gives us. So if you guys are rebuilding teams right now and you have pretty barren rosters, the smart thing to do would be to load up at wide receiver in a good wide receiver class like this one and opt to take your running backs in next year's class when the running back class is better. So um, for me, yeah, I think it's it's very, you know, I would be, I would be, I wouldn't be opposed to taking Marvin, say Malika Romo Dunze, Brian Thomas or Xavier Worthy, 109 taking even like a McConkey or something like that. And then at 201, just I, I would assume at 201, one of the top three quarterbacks would slide there. There's actually more context here because he says he could potentially trade Jaden Reed for his own 2025 first back. In That's a heartbeat, real, dude. In a heartbeat. Really your sharp. first is going to be high, bro. Like you get Jaden Reed off your team. Really sharp move because again, Opens you up now where you could take four wide receivers in the first round and not blink an eye. And Jaden Reed, despite, you know, us liking the prospect profile, us liking the draft capital, us liking the outlook from his rookie season, you can make the case he's one of the more overvalued dynasty wide receivers at this point. Like he's a top 30 ranked dynasty wide receiver. If you can liquidate that for a future first round pick, get out of the volatility for, let's say, if Christian Watson gets back in office him. Let's say, you know, Don Tavian Wicks has a bigger role in the offense. Let's say Romeo Dubs is still a starting X wide receiver for them. Like, there's a lot of ambiguity in the Packers right now to the point where if you can liquidate that straight back for your first round pick, you already mentioned that you need running backs. You could potentially trade Jaden Reed straight up for Ollie Gordon, Ashton Janty, Quinchon Judkins, one of those running backs next year. Yeah, especially if that pick is going to be really high for you. And you also have a nice little running back core of guys that could net you value during the season if things break right for them. Kendra Miller, Tank Bigsby, Tyler Algier, Roshan Johnson, all of those guys have contingent upside if the starter ahead of them goes down and they could turn into um, you know pieces that you could trade potentially during the season. So, I mean, he said, any suggestions with draft strategy? I would say the biggest suggestion I have is take what the NFL draft gives you this year, take the value, and that's usually going to be at wide receiver given the strength of this class. He said, hoping I can be a contender next year i would say next year you should be a house money team after you spend your 2025 picks it would just kind of depend on your hit rate of your picks this year and if you can hit on a lot of those wide receivers this year maybe hit on another tight end um later on in the draft or something like that like bowers or even potentially a jt sanders or something like that he should be well set up so he does have some trades listed here he ended up selling off javante williams and the 107 for the 105 and a third um he did this on uh february 5th so i'm assuming uh, in a one quarterback league, 107 versus 105, you're hoping you can get Bowers there. Because if you can get Bowers at 105, that's going to look like a lot better of a trade. But if you just miss the tier break, you might have sold for Brian Thomas versus the rest of that tier two of wide receivers, which to me wouldn't have been that much of a difference. But you get running back production off of your team. Yeah, for sure. I agree. Uh, by the way, he had a couple more listed trades here. It's just, it was a little too long. So I cut on the trades that he's made this year. So he had some from 2022, from 2023, but these were the most relevant. So I put these in. Uh, you mentioned there, Javante 107, 105, and a third. I think that's a fine value deal, especially considering you're getting the running back production, like you mentioned. And this deal, Tucker Craft 301 for Greg Dolch in a second. It's basically banking Greg Dolchich plus for Tucker Craft. I like Tucker Craft a lot. I think he showed a lot in his rookie season, but he's still fending off Luke Musgrave. I already mentioned the other Packers wide receivers. You did have Jaden Reed on your roster at the time. So getting the upside shot, Greg Dolch can get back to his rookie year level and also liquidating the 301 into a mid project in 2026 second. I think this is a really good process. Yeah, absolutely. Great move there. Um, Definitely a, uh, a pretty sharp one there. So, I mean, looking at this roster, yeah, you got to probably hit on your picks or at least most of them. See if you can punt some more into 25 as well. Again, if you're on the board at 207, somebody's going to give you a second and a third next year. Like definitely good process to do that. You're aiming to fill out your wide receiver core in this class. Maybe get a tight end. If Bowers falls to you, maybe get a quarterback if one of them falls to you because this quarterback class is definitely going to be better than next year's as well. 
And then next year is when you're just going to hammer the running back position and hope you can hit on a bunch of rookie RBs. And then you should be in a house money window as soon as uh, the 2025 season. So we can move on to the uh, next team here, which is from Rylan. You guys can see the team on the screen there, a 10 team PPR super flex league, just Bryce young at quarterback there. So nothing really doing uh, Isaiah Pacheco, Ramondre Stevenson, Zach Charbonnet, Chuba Hubbard, and others at running back Hollywood Brown, Deontay Johnson, Zay flowers, and some others at wide receiver Dallas Goddard, Michael Mayer, not a whole lot going on in the cabinet, at least. I mean, it, they're good picks, but they're not necessarily as high of picks as I would want, given the roster and the state of it right here. Yeah. 107, 108, 201, 301, and then three ones banked in 2025 and another one in 2026. This is kind of, I, I think we talked about a team like this similarly in the last video that we did, where the team is just pretty mid across the board. It's like you don't really have any yeah. star talent. Bryce Young is like your best op upside option for a high end pick. And he's very risky himself. It's not like you have 101, 103 and 105 in addition to your other picks where you're going to add in some superstar uh, rookie talent. You're going to really need to get um, very good at drafting here and hope that you can you can really hit big on, say, a Romo Dunze at 107 or something like that. So I'm assuming you probably had traded your own 2024 first because I, I it says your earliest per pick is the 107. I don't see how this team made the playoffs last year. I'm going to be completely honest, especially knowing that you have no starting caliber quarterbacks in 2020 uh, in the 2023 season. And like Corey said, it's kind of mid across the board. I mean, my reaction is in this 10 man start 10 league. I get it. You, you mentioned it was your first season playing. You you were put behind the eight ball. You got to you got to write the ship, man. You got to write the ship. Isaiah Pacheco, Ramondre Stevenson are sticking out like sore thumbs, in my opinion, because this is not the type of team I want to be holding running backs on, especially ones valued uh, relatively high compared to what, you know, specifically Pacheco. I feel like Ramondre, if you want to hold him the first few weeks, maybe you claim some of his dynasty value, but these are not long term assets for this build. Well, he also mentions too, running back is extremely overvalued in this league. If yes. that's the case, dude, every running back on my team that has any value whatsoever Gone. is getting punted into 2025 and 2026 capital when you can address it in the draft, basically with rookie running backs. And maybe you can get some more running back or uh, draft picks in 2024 as well, because mm -hmm. this team is needs to be retooled, basically torn down the entire running back core, try and punt those assets into quarterback and wide receiver, because right now you don't really have anybody other than say Flowers and Bryce Young that are of any value long term uh, at the quarterback and wide receiver position. Same goes for Deontay Johnson and, and Hollywood Brown. I like them. They're good depth pieces if you're a competitive roster, but you're not a competitive roster right now. So moving off of those yeah. guys, especially you got timely news with Hollywood Brown with Rasheed Rice getting in trouble right now. He might be a guy that you can net a first round pick, even if it's a 2026, just punt him for a 26 first round pick if you can do that. He did say he made some uh, moves in his first season. So I guess this was his first season. He said it put them uh, put him behind the eight ball and he's trying to turn this thing around, but he knows he's a long-term rebuild. So the nice thing is that you do know you have a lot of work to do here. He said, curious what he should do with his picks this year and what he should sell and for what. So let's put a price tag on some of these guys. You should be able to get a one for Isaiah Pacheco. No problem. Yes. I would say a tw like aim for a 26, 25 one for a guy like Ramondre Stevenson. If you can't get that multiple seconds, maybe package him with something else to get a one Charbonnet, Chuba yeah. Hubbard. Maybe you have to wait till the season, Ooh. but I would be okay selling those guys for early the, twos. If you can get them. The other thing you could do is if you can't sell Ramondre straight up for a one, obviously try. You may be able to get a one and two if you packaged him with Hollywood Brown. Hollywood Brown, obviously the the hype right now. Even Goddard too, potentially. Well, I mentioned Hollywood specifically because obviously the buzz around Rasheed Rice, there may be more action, more bite if you were to put him on the market. And if you were to sell Hollywood, see if you can package Ramondre with that, get even more liquidity because they're going to be thinking that, oh, the package is around, you know, selling Hollywood Brown when in actuality, you know, your 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 motive is going to be trying to attach Ramondre to a hot ticket item right now, with, which is what Hollywood represents and seeing if you can get full market value. Yeah, and the other thing too is if running backs really overvalued in this league, that means those 2025 picks are going to be extremely valuable when they come around. So I would really yeah. try and load up in that class because that class is going to be loaded with running backs. If you have the one 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 three one five one six in that class, and you know five of those top six projected picks are expected to be running backs, you might be able to trade down. You might be able to select those guys and move off of them for a king's ransom. So the nice thing is, is you're trying to build out your quarterback and wide receiver core, and your league is going to overvalue running backs, which is going to make it easier for you to retool this thing. He said, should I, you know, go up and try and get one of these top quarterbacks with the 107, 108 pick? 
um, try and get a Jaden Daniels or Drake May. I would say maybe wait until the actual rookie draft is going yeah. on before I would do something like that. Because if at 105 or 106, one of those quarterbacks is sitting there, I would be okay sending away, say, 107 and the 201 for the 105 if Drake May is on the board there and securing yourself a, a top quarterback. Yeah, it fully depends on the context on the board. But uh, the other thing I want to point out, too, is it seems like you made the trade to get the 105 in the mid second. And then, like, did you have like cold feet because you went right back to the guy and got the 108 back? Like, I'm, I'm trying to understand. So basically, what ends up happening is you trade in summary with these two deals, March 18th, March 20, uh, March 20th, is you traded a mid projected 2025 first for the 107, pretty much is the net of this deal. Yeah, essentially. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I like the, I really do like the March 20th trade. If you just take it on its own, where you trade yeah. it down from 105, like in your situation, you're a team that needs a lot. Um, getting the 107 and 108 for the 105 in a mid second is good process in your situation because you could still secure a quarterback there. You could still get JJ McCarthy there. You could still get, you know, say Brock Bowers there, uh, maybe Romo Dunze there. But again, yeah, I, I don't really understand what the thought process was behind making both of these deals too. Cause like, Having the mid first, another mid first in 2025 would have been nice the class for your build as well. Four of the 10 first round picks in a running back heavy draft with a, with a league that overvalues running backs could have put you back ahead of the eight ball. Yeah, exactly. And then the trade that he made on uh, March 1st to get his own first back again, maybe that's the cost of doing business, but you, you did give up an elite quarterback in the process yeah. with Kyler Murray 110. Darnell Mooney in a second. I think this was a fair deal, relatively speaking. I mean, 110, the second in Mooney is about equal to 108, in my opinion, especially in a 10-team league. And then you basically got Kyler Murray back for your own first. Wait, so you traded for the 108, then you traded the 108 away, and then you traded back for the 108 all within two uh, three-week time frame? Yeah, I guess so. But yeah, I mean, looking at this roster, I think you understand you have a lot of work to do here. There's definitely some holes. There's definitely some things that you need to iron out. But anybody that's of any real value to you, and of course, you're a site subscriber. So if you want to know price tags and stuff like that, you can check out the trade value chart. Um, aim to, to get exactly what they're worth, if not potentially more. Maybe you have to wait until the season for Hollywood Brown, Deontay Johnson, some of these guys. But for me, anybody that has value right now, a guy like QJ might be on the up because they uh, cut the top two receivers. Maybe you have to wait until after the draft if they don't take a receiver in the first round or something like that. Um, but regardless, I think you're you're in an okay spot. There's definitely some work and some upside for this team. So uh, let's move on to the next team here, which is from Johnny here. He's got a very loaded cupboard of picks here. 12 team, half PPR. Uh, Superflex League, Bryce Young, also the only main quarterback he has. Not really much going on at running back outside of some zero RB guys. JSN and a bunch of slappies at wide receiver. Kyle Pitts, uh, Tucker Craft there at tight end. But he does have 1-1, one, 1-2, one, 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 1-5, one, 1-6, one, 11, one, 12, 204, and then some other mid-round picks, including an extra one and a couple extra twos in 2025 as oh well. God. So. This one's, um, you know, shopping spree. This is the, this is the fun, fun. I actually really like teams like this where you just got it's, nothing in the cupboards and you can just fun. go with the best player available everywhere. It's just a good time. Like I have a couple experiences like that. I mean, Corey, you know, my Mickey mouse league where I have like all like six or seven of the first rounders this year, like six more in 2025. Like it's just a fun position to be with. Cause it's kind of like, like you said, you're at, you know, shoppers drug mart, you're at, you know, 14 it's like, you're just picking and choosing like, like, like hypothetically, you know, you're chefing up a nice little date meal later on and you're just picking the ingredients that you want for the dish later on. That's basically what you're doing with this team. You're making the ultimate craft, the ultimate dish, and you could choose whatever the ingredients are with this. Yeah. It's like my, t my two lazy to set lineups team is just Justin Jefferson, Josh and Allen and, uh, and Brock Purdy. And then like, I have a million picks outside of those guys. I didn't even know you had Josh Allen. What? <laughs> Or no, is it Josh Allen? Mahomes. Sorry, Mahomes. Oh, right, right, right. Josh Allen. But either way, elite quarterback in, in both yeah, cases. Yeah, um, but yeah, he said obvious deep rebuild situation. He said he's just wondering which direction to go with a 105, 106, and then 111, 112 specifically. So I'm assuming he knows he's going Caleb and Marv with the 11 one and 1-2. One, and then at 105, 106, I mean, this is a team where I'm okay bumping Bryce all the way down to your QB3 after the NFL draft. So if you take yeah. Caleb 1-1 one, one, and you take Drake May or Jaden Daniels with the 105, I'm totally fine doing that. If Malik Neighbors were to fall to you because hypothetically those two quarterbacks go 1-3, one, 1-4, one, you need Malik Neighbors also. So it's not really any, uh, you know, skin off your back. And then at 106, I would 100% be going Odunze. So at 105, yeah. it's going to be whoever falls between Neighbors, Daniels, May, 106, going to be Odunze. That's pretty simple for me. Well, the beauty of this is you're not pigeonholed into a need. So guess what? Like you could just say 101, Caleb Williams, 102, Marvin Harrison, 105. Like you said, if both May and Daniels go before that pick, 
cool, no problem. I'm pivoting. I'm taking neighbors. I'm taking a Dunze. We're completely revamping this receiver core and arguably one of the best wide receiver draft classes of all time. Oh, cool. You want to take neighbors before my pick? Guess what? Now I'm going to be taking either, like you said, May or Jaden Daniels. He does, which looks like here. it's going to be the case based on what he said. He said the guy yeah. at 103 has le- his sights me. locked in on Malik Neighbors. Probably yeah. doesn't need a quarterback. So yeah, he's a bit wary on Daniels. I am as well. So if you're not yes, high yeah. on Daniels, and if he's the guy there at 105, or maybe you get lucky and May falls to you at 105, then you could move off of that pick. You can punt it into future capital. You could trade down, say, or, to get 108 in a future first or something like that for that 105 pick because Jaden Daniels holds that much value as a rushing quarterback. Or you can just venture and saying, hey, this guy at 104 is leading, leaning uh, J- uh, Drake May in that instance. But maybe he's indifferent. Maybe he says, you know what? Uh, it's like picking between a hat. It's a 50-50 call. And you can tell him. You say, hey, listen, what are you leaning at 104? Or maybe he already makes a Drake May pick. Hey, like how close was Drake May versus Jaden Daniels for you? If you wa- would want to make a swap, I can add on the 306. Or maybe he wants you know, a second for a third swap hypothetically next year. You have four seconds if you moved one of the later projected ones to a third like maybe he's willing to make that type of move because realistically from a market value standpoint drake may and Jaden daniels are both going to probably find their way into the mid to late end of the second possibly the two three turn area so if you add a little bit of squeeze there maybe he bites yeah and i remember i had a tr- uh, trade that i made in my rookie draft last year where i was at 102 i took bryce young who was my 102 somebody wanted bryce young for me so i traded down i got two twos for the 103 and i took anthony richardson there because to me they were kind of interchangeable i had a lot of 102s and 103s last year so i wanted to mix up my exposure obviously that trade ended up working out for me because richardson is worth a lot more than bryce young at this point in time but i did actually select bryce young at 102 um and make the trade down so sometimes again when you're the person who makes that 104 pick you get liquidity to move down a spot because you're indifferent towards those guys. Sometimes it can work out big time for you if, say, Jane Daniels had a meteoric rise and that guy trades down from Drake May or something like that. But, I mean, 111, 112, he asked what he should do with that pick. I mean, the guys that I have rated in that area are mainly wide receivers, guys like Xavier Worthy, Brian Thomas, Lad McConkey. Um, you know, if you're high on Adaday Mitchell, that's about the range that I would start to consider him, but I would probably pivot to maybe even a running back. Maybe we get a fifth uh, first round quarterback, like a Bo Nix or something like that. You could dangle that pick to somebody and see if they need a quarterback. But yeah, I, I wouldn't be opposed to trading down from those selections either if you're not high or you're indifferent on, say, Xavier Worthy versus Troy Franklin, who you could probably get at like 2-2, two, 2-3. Two, two, you could always trade down a little bit uh, at that pick specifically. But 1-5 and 1-6, I would probably stick and pick and just go with the guys that you want to go with. But 1-11, 1-12, if you don't like the guys on the board there, you could always trade back or trade into future classes. Yeah, for sure. And before we leave off, uh, I'll just uh, read some of the trades you were able to make. So uh, first one here uh, made on actually, I'm going to read it in you know chronological order. So you sent away Javante Williams, Irv Smith in a 2024 second that ended up being the 203 in exchange for Matthew Stafford and the future soon to be 107. I don't know how you pulled this off. I would rather have Matthew Stafford to Javante and Irv straight up. So I don't know how you also got a second for a first upgrade here. Yeah, yeah, that's a hell of a move. Maybe that guy thought it was going to be a late pick and it was an early pick. So he was thinking, oh, it's like a three pick swap or something like that. But it ended up being what a six or seven pick discrepancy. So uh, yeah. definitely a good move there. He ends up selling off 107 and 211 for Kyle Pitts. Um, I would say that's probably about what he's worth now. You may have I overpaid mean, at the time, but I would say he's probably recouped that value at least since the Kirk I, Cousins signing. I mean, as much as I love Kyle Pitts and I feel like, you know, he's probably worth like the 109 i would say and i'm a kyle pitts guy obviously i've called him the gold truth on this channel for so long at that i do feel like that's an overpay because especially because he could have maybe gotten bowers with that pick bowers straight up first of all i would rather have bowers two pits and you all uh two pits and you also gave up the 211 so either if that was bowers or even i think jj mccarthy's market value is going to end up being higher than kyle pitts once he goes in the top five to ten in the nfl draft so Regardless, if that was the seven or the eight, assuming that those are the top two players off the board, because obviously if it's Odunze, you're not doing that. Well, yet. you're going to pick Odunze because you have one six. So, well, yeah, yeah, I, I guess he already yeah, has one hundred five yeah, and one hundred six. So you're pretty much guaranteed that Bowers yeah. is the one hundred seven. Yeah. So pretty much that would have been Bowers. Um, I mean, if you are, I, I just don't think you should have given up the two eleven to be honest. Like even if yeah, you if, this, Pitts. if you're a big Kyle Pitts guy, I probably should have been one seven straight for Kyle Pitts. But yeah, regardless, if you're a huge Kyle Pitts guy, you don't want to yeah. wait for the rookie tight end to develop in Brock Bowers. I don't think it's a terrible move. No, I, I guess. Get it. Um, and then you send off the one hundred four and the one ten in exchange for the one hundred two. So I'm assuming that you you wanted Marvin. That makes sense. Yeah. I think that's a fair 
Fair I mean, uh, price tag to 301 is uh, kind of inconsequential to me, but I will say your team needs a lot. So I might have just held 104 and 110 and just booked in. You know, you're going to get a quarterback there at 104. You're going to get maybe another quarterback at 105. Maybe you even consider taking Marvin 101 in this situation because you'd have 14, 15, and 16 to yourself. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? But I guess he kind of expressed concern that he's, he's not high on Jaden Daniels. So maybe that's part of why you did this as well. Yeah, like um, unless that guy was just demanding, hey, I know you have 104, 105. I want the 104 100%. Like, did he tell you who he would have wanted there? Like, would he have said, like, yeah, I can't take the 105 because I can't risk you taking, you know, so and so at four? Like, because if he had told you straight up, hey, like, I'm scared you're going to take May at four, so I can't trade for it at five, you should have a lot of context as to who that 104 should be if you're trading that pick away, I would say. Yes, you move up to the 102, you screw Marvin Harrison. I'm fine with that deal. But at the same time, if this guy is now a risk of stifling Drake May from you and you've already expressed concern that you're wary on Jaden Daniels, I wouldn't want to know the context of that deal. Like, did he tell you straight up, oh, I'm leading Daniels? Or, I mean, if he told you he was leading May, I doubt you make this move, right? Yeah, well, and he mentioned he mentions concern with Daniels being there at 105. So I'm assuming he might know that that May is the guy that he's going after. Yeah, so I mean, like if that was the case, I would have tried to push heavily of him taking the 105, even if it ends up upping the cost from 301 to. I mean, you, I guess you didn't have a late second to play with. But I maybe, mean, he has a bunch of twos in 25. If you could right now send him 105 plus a two in 2025 just to move up that one slot because you're not high on Jaden Daniels, I would be okay doing that. And start nine especially, I'm cool with making that move. Well, the other thing too is like if Neighbors is there at 105, you can just take Neighbors. So it's not a big deal. But if Dan, like maybe that's the guy he he wanted, right? At 104, he's like, I'm moving down from 104, uh, 102. I want to make sure I get Neighbors. He might have also thought that as well. But, but, but that guy just ends up getting cucked if the 103 takes Neighbors. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. That's a good point. Yeah, if that guy's going to still take it. But anyways, I think you're in a really good spot. You you Great. just have to fill out the uh fill out the cabinets, spend the spend the spend the grocery money and all that kind oh, of yeah. stuff. But uh we can move on to the next team here, which is from Ace Stroud, a 12 team PPR Superflex. CJ Stroud, Bryce Young is the top guys. Looks like you spent uh your your guys in the uh, class. You do have like three Kevin Harris's, which is funny. Um wide receiver, Jamar Chase, T Higgins, Rasheed Rice, unfortunately. Um Quentin Johnston, a couple other dudes there, Elijah Moore, DeMario Douglas and others. Tight ends, Kyle Pitts, Tucker Craft, Noah Fant, Zach Ertz, and others there. And then he does have a lot of picks as well. 102, 104, 107, 201, 202, 203, 302, number of picks. And then as well as some extra twos in 2025 and an extra three in 2025 as well. So again, very similar build to kind of what we already talked about. He said he earned the 102 last year, and he's kind of just looking for general guidance going forward. Clearly, he has no running backs on this roster, so no chance at truly competing. And he also says very unfortunate Rasheed Rice timing here. Yeah. Um, one thing of note, he said, is that the guy with the 101 is a competitor with Allen and Anthony Richardson at quarterback, and he is actively trying to sell the Caleb Williams pick. So for me, he said he's approached him a few times, but he's unsure it would be a good offer in his position. So if that guy's actively like trying to sell you that pick, there's no chance I give up more than a second rounder to go up one spot to get Caleb personally. Well, well, yeah, but now, now the question is, do you try to see in the situation? I mean, it is a start 12 league, so you probably can't leverage any of the depth. If it was like a start nine or 10, maybe you leverage some depth because you have some needle moving assets, but knowing that you don't have the depth on this team, I wouldn't necessarily, you know, go out there and just throw one Oh four plus. Cause it, it would probably cost too much in my opinion. Oh, you Honestly, can go and get both of them. Pretty much. That's what I was going to say. If it was a start nine or 10, I'm much more willing to do it because you have Chase, because you have Higgins, because you have Rice, uh, nothing at running back, and you have a couple pieces, both at quarterback and tight end. But because of the context that this is a start 12 league, I believe, I mean, like adding up the numbers of the, of the roster it doesn't look like start 12, but. No, three, it, just says six, it just says 12 there, but I think that's it's a, a start three, 10. Yeah, it's a start 10. So, I mean. Oh. I don't know if, if all it costs you say is 104 plus 201 in a future second, maybe to go up to I mean, 101, yeah, I think obviously. that would be okay. Like, I, I don't know. It, it would cost you a, a future first, a hundred percent. Or it would well, cost then I'm not doing it. That's, if that guy's an active yeah. seller of Caleb Williams, he's just going to have to take what he can get. And if nobody else is biting and you're the best offer, he might still so take that. You you wouldn't offer 104 plus 107 for Caleb in this? No, in this business? I would not. No, even, I think even, the value bundle of getting Marvin at 102, whatever quarterback you like at 104 and then, or even neighbors at 104 and taking McCarthy at 107. Like, I just rather, I would rather have that value bundle as opposed sure. to 
having to pay up 104 and 107 to get Caleb and Marvin Harrison. Cause like your roster is still not really in a position where you can just add studs to it. Like I know it's a, a shallower league, but for me, I would rather just have the shot at Marvin Malik and JJ McCarthy, Marvin, um, Drake may and Romo Dunze or whatever. He also listed here. He's got a couple Trevor Lawrence potential deals available. If the cost is only 107 plus Bryce Young, or I mean, I would probably do the 107 plus Bryce Young rather than giving up your own future first. I don't know. Where are you leaning there? Would you I would like, I would sell 107 and Bryce for Trevor, to be honest. But would you rather that or the two ones? 107 plus the future first. I, I'd probably sell Bryce in that instance because then you would have CJ and, Bre uh, and Trevor, and then you could take Marvin Harrison and Malik Neighbors at the 1024. Yeah, I guess the challenging thing there is your team is not in a position to buy elite assets. And maybe you just want to, if you believe in Bryce, maybe it makes more sense to hold 107, hope yeah. that Bryce turns into a good asset. And then, you know, because it's not like Trevor doesn't come with any risk either. If you were sure. buying Herbert or something, it would be a little bit different. But buying Trevor is a little bit more risky. So for me, if you could do 107 plus Bryce Young and maybe get Trevor plus back, like a second back or something, even if it's in 26, just to insulate the trade a little bit. I think that would be a little bit more stomachable, at least for me, because I view Trevor's price tag as as two ones or two and a half ones. But Bryce, I view as a, a, a late first rounder himself. So you are giving up a pretty good, pretty good package to go get Trevor in that situation. I mean, it'd be really tough to get a pick back, to be honest, because I do think even 107 plus Bryce, as much as I like Bryce, it's like Bryce plus Roma Dunes at that point. So if you're equating it to startup cost, what Bryce, even in optimistic leagues, is probably about Fourth a sixth rounder. rounder. Really? You think he goes right? I'd say a fourth up? rounder in like optimistic leagues. Fair. Uh, I, 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 maybe, maybe that's just not the market value I see on Bryce. And I like Bryce a ton. I, the guy, I think he's more of like a fifth, sixth rounder. And Roma Dunze is probably, you know, a fourth rounder. So, yeah, to get up to like that, an early second get, rounder where I have Trevor Lawrence valued. I, and I, think I have it, Trevor Lawrence. Trade makes total sense. And in a start 10, I think yeah. I'm definitely willing to do it. It's just for me, it's like this is this not where your team is ready to do yet. Yeah. That's why I'm kind of hesitant that's on fair. making the move. No, that's fair. Plus, I mean, you, you've kind of banked with the picks that you have uh, on potential upside with this team. And uh, by doing that, I mean, Bryce Young pretty much has to pay out regardless. I mean, yeah, I would be uh, the other thing, too, is I would be way more likely to do a trade like that if I knew I could get neighbors at 104, because if I can get neighbors and Harrison to start my draft, then cool. I have Stroud and Lawrence as my it, top quarterbacks. Maybe I take McCarthy as my third quarterback or Bo Nix or Penix at 201, 202, 203 then I would feel a lot better of the of the way that my team is coming into form. But if I know I have to take a quarterback at Drake May, Jaden Daniels at 104 because neighbors is going to be gone, then I would be definitely much like uh, less likely to take Trevor Lawrence or to do the Trevor Lawrence trade. Well, maybe this is something you do after the draft starts. Once you know who's there at four, if it's Malik Neighbors and you pair Marvin Harrison, Malik Neighbors, you pretty much fix your wide receiver position. Then at that point, if you want to, you know, try to negotiate a spot for a more secure QB2. I'm fine with it. But I mean, you're running the risk where if you do this pre-NFL draft and it's like, oh, fuck, now Drake May's available at 104 because Malik Neighbors. Yeah, it's like you're going to take Stroud, Drake May, and Trevor yeah. Lawrence all together. It's like I probably would still take them or at least try and sell that pick at, at some point. But it would it would be a little bit more annoying. So I would maybe tell that guy sure. it's going to hinge on what happens during the rookie draft because if he can get neighbors at 104, maybe you know you're going to get neighbors because you can just look at the guy who has 103's roster and be like, he has fucking no quarterbacks or something. He's definitely going to take one. For sure. Uh, and obviously, you know, the context of the trade uh, with Rasheed Rice gave up JSN and Mayer March 26th. Oh, right dude, he before. did it like a week ago. That's brutal. I, <laughs> right to before. be honest, I still, I actually view, this might be a hot take. I think that JSN is still a riskier asset than Rasheed oh. Rice. He's definitely a risky asset. I don't know about riskier because, I mean, there's still the, the Henry. Well, I read Drew Davenport's here. legal update yesterday, and he basically said, like, there's not really any basis for him getting suspended here because it sounds like it's just a traffic accident unless we hear, you know, that they DUI. were carrying weapons or that there was a DUI involved or something like yeah. that. There's not really any basis for because it's just a misdemeanor because nobody was injured in the in the uh, in the accident. He might get one to four games is what Drew Davenport said, but he actually would bet on no suspension. Yeah at this point in time until more yeah. details come out. If there was, you know, if they had weapons in the car or there, you know, that kind of stuff, then obviously he would get more time for that. But it sounds like they didn't have any contraband or they weren't under the influence or anything like that. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it could definitely still work out. Um, I mean, it just opens up a buy window potentially for Rashid Rice if you have that information in the context available to you. So we'll uh, we'll see what happens. But overall, uh, you're obviously in a good spot. You have the job capital, just spend it wisely. Like we kind of said, we know we know what A Stroud's about. He's he's a, a consistent submitter to dynasty decisions, and uh, he's put himself up in a good spot.
Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, um, that, that T-Law trade, maybe tell them that you're probably going to wait till the rookie draft or at least yeah. do some research on that 103 pick. Maybe you can just go in that guy's DMs because I've had people do this. Like I'll ask people like, hey, what are you thinking at 103? And they'll just be like, oh, I'm going to take Malik Neighbors. I do it's the like, exact they probably shouldn't thing. tell me that, but they do. No, I do the exact same thing. And like, honestly, like that all happens because I mean, like if you don't have a good relationship with your league mates, like they're not just going to tell you that shit. Like that's why like, man, like checking in on your league saying, hey, listen, I saw you guys, you know, put this up. Like, it's good keeping good also not being man. the guy that sends piss trade offers. That's because yeah. like, like, if you are that guy in your league, nobody's ever going to tell you stuff like that. A hundred percent. Right. And like that, that's the one thing I've learned too, from experience is like sending consistent offers saying, okay, this is how I came to this offer. This is how the valuation cracked out of my head. Obviously this is what you need. This is what I need. This is the context of my team. This context of your team, like explaining that in those talks, man, like giving as much information as you can. Maybe it's a little easier from, from our position as content creators, but making sure they know that you're not coming with ill intention is the best way to approach trades. I almost always, this is something that maybe we should, uh, you know, a tip that we could give to people. I almost always send a message with every trade offer that I send out where I'm like, yeah. I was thinking about this in your, like your team needs wide receivers, blah, blah, blah. I don't just like send offers and see what happens. You know what it's I mean? Like, a like cold I call. usually, I usually tell them my rationale behind the trade offer cool. and why I thought it would be of a benefit to them. It's like, Hey, I saw that you're like a chargers fan and it looks like you could use a wide receiver. Are you interested in QJ kind of thing? Yeah. No, a hundred percent. It's like, for example, if you guys have ever, you know, been at a call center or something like that, when you receive a cold call from a call center, like, are you likely a to pick up or B, even if you pick up kind of like, something. <laughs> yeah, right. Understand where they're coming from. Are you more likely to do that? Or you're more likely to answer when your nun is calling you telling you that, that the cookies are ready. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's the, the attitude that you approach a trade discussion with is definitely helpful. Yeah. And again, this is a good message to everybody. It's like, if you don't know what the guy ahead of you is going to do in the rookie draft, because he has an equal need at wide receiver and quarterback, hypothetically, literally just ask him. Yeah, and he might ask. actually tell you if you have a good relationship yeah, with that manager. For sure. So um, we can move on to the next team though. We uh, got a little sidetracked there, but big <laughs> P walk is the one that we got here. 12 team, half PPR, last team of the video. Super, uh, one quarterback league though. So we got Kyler Murray to a Geno Smith as the main guys, JT, Josh Jacobs, Barkley, other guys there at running back, Chase, Puka Nakua, A.J. Brown, Chris Godwin, Josh Downs, and others at wide receiver. Travis Kelsey, dead giveaway that this is a competitive team, doesn't have any picks in 2024, but he does actually have his own first rounder in 2025. So, I mean, a pretty easy piece of advice here is that you're going to try and win next year because you have a very good team in general. Like, you're starting yeah. roster to start eight league. I mean, you're going to have Kyla Murray, JT, yeah. Josh Jacobs, Chase, Puka, uh, A.J. Brown, and Barkley in your flex with Kelsey as your tight end. Like, I, I would challenge a lot of the people in your league to see if they can put up a better starting lineup than that. Um, depth is a concern, but again, it's a start eight, one quarterback league. I'm not overly concerned about acquiring depth. If you absolutely needed to do that, you still have your first next year of buying power. So he did make a couple trades and he also said he made a, a trade for Kelsey as well. Um, he did say, uh, actually let's just go over the trades here. So we got on, uh, November 7th in 2023, he sold off Justin Fields, Sky Moore in a second for Kyler Murray and Josh Downs. That obviously has aged very well because Kyler Murray is worth a lot more than Justin Fields. Even though it's not a super flex league, you still kind of raked this guy over the coals because I think Josh Downs is worth more than a second rounder. And I would definitely take Murray over Justin Fields and Sky Moore. And then you sent, um, it looks like he got Kelsey for Andrews. He got Kelsey. What happens here. Yeah. Um, he uh, sent away Andrews and got Kelsey, as I imagine. He just mixed up where it's where it's labeled there. Yeah, I mean, I understand the context at the time. I'm assuming this is right after Mark Andrews suffered a season-ending injury. You're a heavy contender. You're trying to buy the production. Kelsey was not the player to buy at that spot. And I understand, like, oh, he's giving me this production. But at the same time, it didn't take much foresight to see that he would be pretty much a dead ass at this offseason. And now, well, like, and like saying, my other thing would be, like, at that time, on November 23rd, how much more would it have costed you to get Laporta? No, a hundred percent. I mean, like uh, that's what I was going to get into in a second. Cause he does uh, say here, like I've tried to uh, try, uh, I've tried to sell Kelsey. Nobody's willing to bite. It's like, I could have foresaw that because he's an old, I mean, the end. nice thing is you're competitive. So you could just hold the production yeah. and that's kind of the state you're at with Travis Kelsey. Derek Henry's the same way at running back, even Christian McCaffrey potentially yeah. at running back. Like it's so hard to sell these guys. Like if you're not a competitive team, like you're, you're kind of screwed with these assets because you're going to end up selling them way too low. But yeah. the nice thing for you is that at least you're a competitive team. You could just ride off Kelsey until he's a dead asset. Well, hundred percent. And he, he says here questions I have, I've tried to move Kelsey, but seems like nobody has any interest in him straight up. He says he understands why do I try to package a running back with him or do I ride him until he retires? Like Corey said, you have no choice, man. Your position, your team is in position to win. 
Travis Kelsey is not going to get you market value that you'd look for based off the production value he can provide to your contending team. No brainer, in my opinion, you're keeping Travis Kelsey at this point because you already traded for him. You mentioned if you are traded him, what would you go after? Laporta owner said he is not interested in Kelsey. I do not blame the Laporta owner. Not, not even one bit. Kelsey. Not at all. Yeah, I would. If you got a, tra- a deal in my inbox with Kelsey and Laporta involved, I'd be like, you're going to have to give me a lot more for the long term yeah. value that I got from Laporta. Like, Wait. you'd be hard pressed to sell Kelsey for David and Joku, Kyle Pitts, Dalton oh, easily. Kincaid, yeah. Guys. Like, at that point, like, they're not even going to take those. Well, uh, if, you're not even going to get those guys for Kelsey at this point. If I had Sam Laporta and somebody sent me an inbox offer of Kelsey plus like a second for Laporta, I'd just be like, oh, did you mean to add two first instead of the second? Like, two mid projected 2025 ones? Because, like, other than that, like, there's no way I'm freaking selling off Laporta at this point. Yeah, especially to start 8-1 quarterback. Laporta's probably a borderline first-round startup pick yeah. in that format, to be honest. I mean, we we did, what, a 10-team a te- a, a startup league or a 12-team startup league uh, in the mock draft a couple uh, days ago? Yeah, we did a one-quarterback startup, and I believe he two was a five. second I took him 2-5. Two yeah, 2-5. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, yeah, so I mean, with Kelsey, he's this Bermuda Triangle asset of like you can't sell him, you just have to use him kind of thing. Like that's just where he's stuck in. Derrick Henry was stuck there last year; he still is, to be honest. And same with Christian McCaffrey, where it's like if you can't use him, you're kind of just fucked, and you have to sell low on him if you're trying yeah. to sell him off. Um, so he said, where um, basically should I trade next year's first for more depth? Only I would do that in season. In season. If you absolutely had to because there's no reason to do that now. You're foreseeing like injuries yeah. that haven't even happened yet. To be honest, and even if AJ Brown missed seven games with a hamstring pull, it's like Godwin and Quentin Johnson and Josh Downs, they're good enough that they can work into your lineup yeah. and still tread water for you. Not to mention, A, you need the liquidity in case things do go wrong, which I doubt they will given the context of your team, but you have that security. B, like Corey said, you have buying power in season where if a team that expected to compete ends up, you know, starting bad, maybe all it costs is a 2025 one plus, I don't know. Saquon Barkley for Christian McCaffrey in 2025 too. Like maybe somebody's willing to make that type of move. And at that point, you can obviously make it in season. Not to mention too, start at league. Like if we're, you know, equating your starting lineup right now, you have Kyler Murray slash Tua as your starting quarterback. You have as your two running backs, D- JT and Jacobs with Barkley as your flex. You have Those a wider second round redraft picks. Chase Puka yep. and AJ Brown are all first and second round redraft yep. picks. Kelsey's Kelsey a second or third round redraft pick. Like your team's loaded for a redraft. Yeah. No, hundred percent. So, I mean, you, you should be able to maybe, uh, maybe if not win the championship, you at least be able to get into the final again. Yeah. I mean, he lost in the final uh, by 50 points in championship week because of Kelsey and chase and classic Brown, um, totaling no points. That's a class dude. That's my story of my life in tone setter truthers, man. I have a loaded, I, I've lost like three weeks or five weeks or something in like three seasons uh, that we've been in that league um in the regular season then we get to the playoffs and i get bounced around one or round two every single time so i feel you on that one but yeah i mean there's not really much else to say you're gonna try and win the championship hold your picks don't get antsy with this team you have good enough depth at the moment to be able to um handle any injuries that come your way like you you go three deep with elite running backs you go three deep with elite wide receivers with some half decent depth again guys like quentin johnson like he made a trade where he sold off khalil shakir for qj Dan, Khalil sure. Shakir isn't really worth anything. It's like, yeah, he might have been a little bit better of depth for you because I think production value on a median projection, he might be better than QJ. But Quentin Johnston's upside that, you know, all of his other receivers are gone, even if they draft Malik Neighbors or Marvin Harrison or something like that, maybe that pushes him into a role that he's more comfortable in and he actually gives you some value in the long term. So if you like QJ, I don't mind that as an upside swing. He made this on February 23rd also, and this was prior to um, – Mike Williams and Keenan Allen getting cut and traded. So it's possible that you could even sell QJ for more now than when you made this trade. Yeah, no, I would agree with that. Yeah, for sure. So that is the end of the video. Hopefully you guys made it all the way to the end. If you did leave a like down below, subscribe to the channel. If you are new, uh, as you guys are watching this today, I'm flying off to Mexico. So we got some preloaded videos. We're going to be live. I'll be doing live streams for my uh, Airbnb throughout the week as well, but a little bit of a lighter content week, Wednesday to Wednesday, I'll be back on the 10th and we'll gear back up for a lot more tail the tapes and all that good stuff. So should be a lot of fun. Um, Less than a month away from the NFL draft. I'm sure you're excited. We are very excited as well. And of course, if you guys want to be on future Dynasty Decisions episodes, you can subscribe to flockfantasy.com. Use that promo code FSE. When you use that promo code, you'll have access to these episodes. You can submit your teams. We'll break them down in the video. I'm sure a lot of you guys are going to have rookie draft questions. A lot of you guys are going to have questions coming up in the next few weeks as we get through the NFL draft. But with that being said, peace out, and we'll talk to you soon.